All right, good afternoon. Uh, today we're talking about the Great War, also known as World War I. World War I goes from 1914 until 1918. Now, even though this is about World War I, I do have to talk about what happens before World War I. And I'm going to call that the prelude to World War I. Uh, first thing is Germany. Uh, if you remember in a previous lecture, when we were still meeting in person, we talked about Germany, Otto von Bismarck, and how Germany created a new country out of Prussia. Otto von Bismarck was kind of the, the architect behind that. And then there's a war called the Franco-Prussian War. And the country of Germany is created in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles Palace in the in right outside Paris. Well, Germany is created through a military engagement. It's created through a war. Louis Napoleon or Napoleon III loses the war. He's kicked out of office and Germany is going to be a new country. Well, after the war is over, Otto von Bismarck, he is going to step away from the military option that created his country. He says that the, using the military is too dangerous. And Otto von Bismarck is going to come up with this idea of creating an alliance system that would keep France all by itself and war would be prevented and Europe would just kind of continue continuing like it had since the end of Napoleon. So what Otto von Bismarck is going to do is he's going to maintain relations with Austria-Hungary. The people of Austria are Germanic. They are seen as German peoples, but they were under a separate emperor, separate government going all the way back to um, Frederick the Great. Germany is also going to maintain a formal understanding with Russia. The Kaiser or the Emperor of Germany. His name is Wilhelm. He's actually a cousin to the Russian Tsar, Tsar Nicholas. So they kind of have an understanding with each other. And then when it comes to France and Britain, Germany was going to rely on the fact that France and Britain had hated each other for hundreds of years. And he was also going to rely on the fact that Britain and Russia hadn't been friendly with each other since before the Crimean War. So Germany is taking a couple of gambles here to make this alliance system work. Uh, in 1898, though, Germany decides it's going to build a navy. And this navy is going to be bigger than anybody else. It's going to have cruisers, battleships. They are going to have the strongest army in Europe. They're now threatening to have the strongest navy in Europe. And Britain says, whoa, wait a minute. Germany might be an enemy. And when Germany starts to build up its navy and it already has the strongest army, army, Britain decides they need to do something about this. So in 1902, Britain is going to sign an alliance with Japan. Now you might wonder, why Japan? Japan's on the other side of the world. Well, it's because Japan and Britain are going to sign a treaty of equals. Britain is going to ask Japan to watch over and keep their colony safe in Asia, and then Britain is going to use all of those ships that they had in the Pacific Ocean and bring them back home just in case there's a war with Germany. In 1904, Britain is going to sign a surprise alliance with France. This is known as the Entente Cordiale, and nobody saw this coming, especially not Germany. And suddenly, on Germany's western side, two former enemies are friends with each other and Germany's starting to get a little worried. And then in 1907, after 50 something years of being enemies, Britain and Russia sign a treaty and bury the hatchet and suddenly Germany finds itself surrounded on almost all sides with people who don't really like them very much. Germany is completely shocked, Germany is unprepared, and Germany really has one ally left, and that's Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary by now is starting to fall apart. And this is going to be a disaster for Germany, they just don't know it. 
Now there are going to be two alliances that form. You got one that's called the Triple Alliance. That's Britain, that's France, that's Russia. And you can see the three flags of those countries as of 1913. Notice there's no United States. The United States at this point in time, they consider themselves neutral. The United States has no plans on getting involved in any European wars. And in fact, Europe and the United States have pretty much stayed apart from each other since the 1830s or so. On the other side, you have what becomes known as the Triple Entente. They're eventually going to be known as the Central Powers. But before the war, their alliance was known as the Triple Entente. Uh, you got Germany, who is the most powerful of the three countries. You got Austria-Hungary, and their flag has that little green part that represents Hungary. And then you got the Ottoman Empire, which is today known as Turkey. Now, Italy is kind of sort of part of their side, but Italy is going to backstab Germany and side with Britain and France almost at the very, very last minute. But these are your two different alliances, the main powers in them and how they're going to line up. Now, we got to focus on Austria-Hungary because Austria-Hungary is going to be the real driving force behind this. And you may have to pull out a map so that you can follow along. And if you do, I'll give you about 30 seconds to pull one up. All right, that's close enough to 30 seconds. You're probably not pulling up a map. But in 1908, Austria-Hungary is going to annex, meaning they're going to take over uh, a place called Bosnia and a place called Herzegovina. Uh, both Bosnia and Herzegovina were formerly part of the Ottoman Empire. And the people who lived in both Bosnia and Herzegovina were Slavic people. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, both of those were territories that Serbia wanted because Serbia was also Slavic. I remember from, uh, I think, last lecture, Serbia wanted to create this big country called Yugoslavia or Union of Southern Slavs. And they wanted Bosnia and Herzegovina to be part of that. Well, Austria-Hungary steals it first. Well, in 1911, we have something known as the First Balkan War. That's a war a lot of people don't know about. They don't hear about it. And quite frankly, a lot of historians don't teach about it either. But Italy is not going to declare war on the Ottoman Empire because Italy wants additional territory on the um, Adriatic Sea. Um, Bulgaria is going to become an independent country in 1908. And during 1911, during this first Balkan War, Bulgaria is going to grow in size. So you've got two countries, Italy and Bulgaria, who have nationalistic tendencies. They're trying to get bigger. They're trying to get stronger. Well, we have a second Balkan War that breaks out in 1913. And you've got the countries of Greece, Serbia, Romania, the Ottoman Empire. They're all fighting Bulgaria. The country of Albania is formed. Austria-Hungary tries to take advantage of Serbia and get more territory. And then Serbia is trying even harder to unite all the Slavic people into a country known as Yugoslavia. So the Balkan territory, the mountains where Greece and Turkey and the Hungary and Romania, where Bulgaria is, the, all those mountains, the Balkans, are a real, real powder keg that's just getting ready to explode. And you have Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire who are trying to be the two dominant forces in that area. And then you have places like Serbia who are trying to rise up and become more powerful, more important, and really flex their muscles. Well, Austria-Hungary is going to manage to stop Yugoslavia from forming for a minute, and that's going to make people in Serbia really hate the Austrians. Now we have the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Now Franz Ferdinand, it's a name you've probably heard before. Um, he was the next in line to become the ruler of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And the guy who was emperor, his name was Franz Joseph. And if I remember right, he was like in his 80s. He knew he was getting old. And he picked a relative of his, not his son, but a relative named Franz Ferdinand to become the new, the new uh, emperor. And I just realized I have a typo in here. So let me fix this right now so it looks 
correct. In June 1914. That's embarrassing, but hey, it's live. So in June of 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to go to a city called Sarajevo. Uh, Sarajevo was the capital of Bosnia. Bosnia is a new territory of Austria-Hungary. And basically, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is saying, hello, I'm going to be your new emperor uh, here shortly in a couple of years once the old emperor dies. Welcome to our country. And while in Sarajevo, Franz Ferdinand and his wife are assassinated by members of the Black Hand, which was a Serbian terrorist organization. Now, the story of Franz Ferdinand's demise is actually kind of interesting. Um, Franz Ferdinand and his wife are touring the city. They're in an open air car where they can wave at all the people and hug the babies and kiss the grandmas and everything else. And the Black Hand decide that they are going to try and kill him. Um, the first chance to kill him, the gun that's going to be used doesn't go off. It backfires or misfires, whatever you want to call it. A second person has a chance to kill him and throws a grenade and the, the grenade misses the car and the car speeds off and the driver of the car takes a turn, turns into a dead end alley and has to back up. And the third member of the Black Hand who was there, uh, he was eating lunch. Uh, his name was Gavrilo Princep. Gavrilo Princep says, oh my God, that's the Archduke and sits there and shoots him. Um, the Archduke, his first worry is to make sure his wife was okay. He didn't realize he was shot or didn't realize how badly he was shot. Gravilo Princep runs away. He jumps into some water to escape. The water is like knee deep or ankle deep. It's not very, not very deep. He breaks a leg. Then he tries to chew on a, a pill of, of poison, but the poison is expired. So he actually ends up being arrested and dies in jail in 1918. But Austria-Hungary is going to use this event to crush Serbia and its anti-Austrian movement. And Austria-Hungary is going to give Serbia a list of 21 demands. Uh, some of these demands are to let Austria-Hungary do the investigation. Austria-Hungary is going to demand Serbia to ban the Black Hand, get rid of any politician who is anti-Austrian, all these other things. And then two things that Serbia just cannot agree to. They agree to 19 out of 21 demands. The 20th demand that Serbia did not agree to, let the Austrian military occupy Serbia while the investigation was going on. And Serbia says, no, 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 your military can't come in here. So what's the 21st demand? Serbia had to agree to all other 20. Well, if it doesn't agree to, to number 20, it definitely can't agree to number 21. So Serbia agrees to 19 of the 21 demands. Austria isn't satisfied with that, and Austria declares war on Serbia. Now, there's also something happening in the background called the blank check. Secretly, Austria-Hungary went to the German government and said, hey, Germany, if we end up in a war, we're not going to tell you what's going on. We're not going to tell you what's happening. But if we end up in a war, do you have our back? And Germany says, whatever you need, we got you. We'll take care of you. So Austria leaves that meeting rubbing their hands together, and they go and they declare war on Serbia. Now, Serbia turns around and asks Russia for help. Russia, if you remember, was seen as the big brother to Serbia and all the Slavic people. Austria is going to ask Germany for help, say, hey, you remember that, that deal we just made? Well, now it's time to cash it in. And suddenly, a war is going to begin on accident. Now, Russia only wanted to mobilize, meaning Russia only wanted to put into action a small part of its army. It only wanted the part of its army that was along the Austrian border to go into effect and to start moving. Problem is, every battle plan Russia had centered around a war with Germany, too. 
Germany tries to back out of its alliance with Austria, but Austria says, no, 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 you signed this piece of paper. And so um, we're going to hold you to it. So this problem is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Germany decides, okay, if we cannot get out of this, if we have to be held by our, our deal, then we're going to have to put into use our secret Schlieffen plan, also known as the von Schlieffen plan. And this von Schlieffen plan was super secret. It involved a total mobilization of the army, meaning every soldier in the army was going to move as quick as possible. And it was a two-part plan. Part one involved attacking France, going fast, going hard, going through Belgium, keeping close to the sea so that Britain couldn't land reinforcements, knocking France out of the war within, I think it was three weeks, and then turning around and moving all of the army back across Germany and hitting Russia before Russia could get ready. It was estimated that it would take Russia three months to get their army to fight. And the hope was by the time three months is up, we'll have defeated France, England will stay out, and we'll be back and able to fight Russia. Well, when Germany launches their attack on France because they thought it was the only way to save themselves because of Austria-Hungary screwing things up, it put that entire alliance system into effect. Britain's going to land reinforcements. Britain and France are going to stop the Germans from getting to Paris. They're going to save the day. The rumor is the German army could see the Eiffel Tower in the distance. That's how close they got to getting victory in France. But instead, what should have been a three-week victory over France turns into a four-year ordeal. Now, the actual fighting of World War I, uh, troop strength, the Triple Alliance, which is going to be Russia, Britain, and France, they've got about 30 million troops available. Numbers vary a little bit. 30 million will get you in the right neighborhood. The Triple Entente, now known as the Central Powers, uh, they're going to have about 25 million troops, so that's a lot there as well. A lot of this war is going to be about economics. The British Navy is going to blockade the coast. The British Navy is going to try and wear down the Central Powers, stop them from getting imports, stop them from doing exports, and kind of choke them out. The German Navy is going to use a brand new creation called a U-boat, a submarine. And U-boat in German means Unter See Boat, underwater boat. The idea was the U-boats would go underwater, they would come up, they would sink British ships, and then they would go back underwater. Now, what really happens is eventually Germany is going to run out of food, Germany is going to run out of supplies as the war drags on, and the German people are not going to have a very good time. Austria-Hungary, I didn't put it in here, but Austria-Hungary... Um, they are going to have a lot of trouble too, just because there are so many different nationalities that were in Austria-Hungary that their empire was already on shaky ground, and this is going to tear them apart. Trench warfare is going to be what happens in the West. Uh, there are going to be trenches all over the place in the West. There's going to be huge battles where Hundreds of thousands of men are just going to be thrown into battle for very, very small pieces of territory. Uh, there's the Battle of the Somme, S-O-M-M-E. The Battle of the Somme happens in 1916. Britain and France get about 125 square miles of territory, and they lose 600,000 men. At Verdun... The Germans get about 20 square miles of land, and they're going to lose 500,000 men. So trench warfare is going to result in huge battles, huge losses of life. And one of the biggest reasons so many people are going to die is because of new weapons. There's improved artillery. The machine gun has been perfected. Poison gas is going to be used for the first time by the Germany. And there's going to be dogfights, air power, there's going to be airplanes used. Now, Eastern warfare in Russia, 
Eastern warfare in what is today Poland and Austria and Hungary territory, that's still going to be an old style war. That's still going to have horses and movement and, and it's going to be more like one of those old school Napoleonic wars. And that's mostly because the Russian army was just so ill-equipped. The Russian army was still fighting old school battles. Now, what is trench warfare? First of all, you could walk all the way from the English Channel to Switzerland underground. There was a connecting line of, of trenches that would go all the way from Switzerland to the English Channel. These trenches, there's multiple trenches, they're in zigzag formations, and they did that because they didn't want an enemy to get in a trench and be able to shoot hundreds of feet down and kill everybody, so there were usually zigzags every so many yards. The land between the two trenches was called no man's land. That's where um, barbed wire was. That's where mines were put. Uh, a really nasty place there. Each day began and ended with something called stand to. Um, at the break of dawn and then when the sun is going down, soldiers from both the enemies would get ready for battle in case the other side did um, went over the top meaning attack out of their trenches. Uh, the, the reason those were the most likely times is because that's when it was hardest to see because of the angle of the sun. And then repairs on these trenches were completed at night. Uh, the German trenches were nicer than the French and British trenches. Uh, Germany, they were just trying to defend the territory that they had already taken. And so they made their trenches very nice and very livable. The British and the French, they tended to make their trenches not so nice because they didn't want their soldiers to get used to being there. So they always encouraged their soldiers to continue. Another interesting thing about trench warfare is there would be machine guns pointed at the enemy, but then there would also be machine guns pointed at your own men. Because when the time to attack came, when the whistle blew, everybody was expected to climb out of the trench, run through no man's land, and take the enemy trench. And if anybody didn't do what they were supposed to do, then they would get shot by their own men. It was a very, very rough time. Now, what was the impact on European culture? Well, the people of Europe, they could not comprehend the amount of lives lost. They could not understand the destruction. It was something that they had never seen before. And... They didn't know how to deal with it, and it really messed with the European psyche. Uh, propaganda was all over the place. Uh, propaganda was used to convince people to fight. Propaganda was used to convince people that the enemy was the enemy. Propaganda was used to convince people to contribute to the war. And you can Google propaganda posters from World War I, and they're all over the place. Uh, in France and Britain, the disease called rubella was suddenly renamed German measles. And German classical music, Brahms, Beethoven, Mozart, that was actually banned from being played. Another impact on European culture, a lot of aristocrats were killed off because the aristocrats were serving as the officers. The officers were leading the soldiers in these hopeless charges against entrenched enemies, and officers died in overwhelming numbers. Enlisted men after the war is over, they in demand increased rights because they have lived and died and bled for their country and they feel like they should get more out of it. Now you also have the United States that's going to become involved in the war. Um, at the beginning, the United States was officially neutral. The president, Woodrow Wilson, asked people to remain neutral in thought and neutral in action. But secretly, the United States are going to start lending equipment and money supplies to Britain and France. Now, Germany draws the United States into war by doing three things. Number one, they sink a ship called the Lusitania. The Lusitania was advertised as a, a passenger ship, a luxury liner. And when the Lusitania was sunk, it was put into the newspaper like it was an innocent ship with hundreds of Americans on it, but in reality, the Lusitania was smuggling weapons and supplies from the United States to Germany. A second thing Germany does is they start doing unrestricted submarine warfare. 
when the war first started, the German submarines used this, I'll call it a code of conduct, meaning the German submarine would find a British ship, they would come to the surface, they would warn the British ship, good sir, you're about to get sunk, please remove your men from the ship. The men would abandon ship, the German submarine would sink again, shoot down the British supply ship, and then continue on its way to find another ship. Well, what started happening is the British would say, hold on, I'm going to get my men off the ship, and then they would start radioing for help. So Germany had to quit giving warning that they were going to sink ships, and that becomes known as unrestricted submarine warfare. That was seen as un dishonorable, and that became a big problem for the United States because the U.S. was sending ships to Britain and the U.S. ships started to get sunk. The last thing that draws the United States into war is something called the Zimmerman Telegram. Germany promises Mexico that if you declare war on the United States, we will help you get your territory in the southwest back. So Germany was willing to help Mexico win back Arizona, New Mexico, California, that part of the United States. When those three things come together, President Woodrow Wilson has no choice but to ask Congress to declare war on Germany. Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to do that on April 2nd, and on April 4th, 1917, the United States declares war on Germany officially. Now, the United States is going to send about 2 million soldiers to France. Uh, they don't make as big of an impact as you might think, but they, it is an important impact. Uh, they are going to relieve all the war-weary troops. They're going to be fresh faces in the trenches. About 10,000 U.S. soldiers per day pour into the war, and they're going to plug holes in the front and keep the French army from collapsing. Russia is a whole nother story. Uh, starting 1914, 1915, the first year, Russia is able to fight a relatively even war against both Austria, Hungary, and Germany. But by 1916, the Russian army begins to lose, and they begin to lose bad. Uh, Russian soldiers are being sent to the war without guns, without uniforms, without supplies. And they're literally being told, if your comrade falls, if your neighbor falls, take their gun and keep firing. Uh, it's really hard to fight a war without a weapon. And the British and the French, just they can't help the Russians. There's not enough supplies to go around. So Russia starts to do very, very badly. Um, starting in 1915, 1916, they start to lose over 3 million men per year. Um, there's going to be a revolution in Russia. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, Russia is actually going to sign a treaty with Germany, and that treaty is going to, to take Russia out of the war. Now, before I go on to the next slide, here is your secret word of the day. Your secret word of the day is going to be cat. C-A-T, cat. Now, you might ask why. It's because I have a lazy cat sleeping right in front of me. All right, Germany is going to surrender. The war grinds to a halt in 1918. The German people don't realize what's happening because the German government keeps everything secret. All the Germans know is that there's not enough food anymore. They're, they're starting to eat turnips and not really, really healthy food. But the German government keeps saying, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. Well, the German army, the general staff of the German army realizes, you know what? We're not winning. We're at the best at a stalemate, and we're going to start losing. So the German army opens up negotiations for a ceasefire. The German people have no idea how close the German army is to collapse. And U.S. President Woodrow Wilson says, if you want peace, the German Kaiser must resign. A republic must be created. So the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, abdicates. Something called the Weimar Republic is created, and the war is going to end. A, a ceasefire is going to be claimed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 
In Europe, that's called Remembrance Day, and here in the United States, it's Veterans Day. The German citizens are shocked when this happens. The German citizens are confused when this happens. And the German army itself says, whoa, 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 we did not surrender. We just called for a ceasefire. So th there was a lot of questionable stuff that happened here. And Britain, France, and the United States says, okay, well, if this was not your surrender, we're more than happy to start fighting again. Now, there are a lot of impacts on the war. Um, first of all, lots and lots of people are killed. There are strikes in Germany, strikes in Britain, strikes in France. There's a rebellion in, in Ireland. Ireland gets its independence from Britain in 1916. Uh, there's mass inflation around the world. There's a lot of war debt after the war is over. And then it's, it's even worse in Germany, and I'll talk about that next week, because Germany did not see itself as defeated. No German territory was invaded. The German army was still located in France, and the German people just could not accept that they had lost, because to them it didn't look like it had. There's going to be a peace treaty in Paris that is signed, I'll talk about next week, and a lot of the outcome of World War I is going to bring us World War II. All right, that is it for today. Uh, don't forget to do your quizzes for this week. Don't forget to look for that secret word quiz, and then I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.